my dad, he was a co-founder for Solidarity, the movement that eventually kicked communism out of Poland. As soon as he got arrested, the Babushka network went out and they said, Leszek got arrested at the train station. And my mom's like, oh no, because she's got propaganda papers on the dinner table. So she stuffs them together and then she hears the, the bootjacks coming up the apartment complex stairwell. And she knows they're coming for her. So she grabs them, she shoves them in my diaper, knowing that that's probably the only place the communists aren't going to look. and welcome to Opportunity Made, the podcast that is based upon the idea that we can make new opportunities for ourselves and others on a regular basis if we're willing to take chances, be intentional in our actions, and invest deeply in our own lives. I am your host, Katherine Lewis. I am a European-American woman with short, blonde, wavy hair, which is currently tied back. I am wearing a blue knitted top and there is a white wall behind me. Today, we are talking about maximizing opportunity with U.S. Army Special Forces Green Beret, Jacek Walicewski. Welcome, Jacek. Thanks for having me. How are you? Doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Do you mind giving an audio description of yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I am a Caucasian male wearing a light blue button-down shirt. I'm sitting in my living room. Behind me is a map of the world with pins of places that I've seen or visited or worked in. Uh, I'm Polish, and uh, when I had hair, because I'm bald now, but uh, when I had hair, it was a dark hazel. I love the map behind you, and approximately how many pins do you have in there? It's a uh, lot. I'm at over 40 countries, uh, so it's uh, all through the US, US uh, up to Alaska, there's uh, Afghanistan, there's a couple of pins in there, and then there's just a boatload in Europe and uh, a couple in Africa, as well as the Middle East. Wow. So really all over the place. What's your yeah. favorite place that you've traveled? Oh, that's a good question. I would have to say, well, there's two, two different reasons. Uh, Sweden would be one, and then Kenya would be another. The people are amazing. The cultures are amazing. They're completely contrasted, or especially in Kenya. But um, even though that, uh, it's just a great place to be. And the people are welcoming. That's one of the best things. When I think about those two different places, Sweden and Kenya are totally different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like really the people make it the best experience, right? Even though yes. it's so contrasting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was actually born in Poland, um, left when I was about three. And so I've lived in five or six different states, um, moved back to Europe in the 90s, came back to the States in 2000 and onward, moved to Germany. Uh, that was my first duty station. And so my life has always been somewhere else. It's never grounded in one location. So Sweden and Kenya, some, some of the most welcoming uh, cultures I've ever been to. I know I have family from Sweden and I have family that work often in Kenya. So it sounds like two oh. places that I need to visit. <laughs> so. That's amazing. Do you know, do you know where in Sweden? I don't, I don't, that would be something I'd love to explore is do a little bit of family history. Yeah. Yeah. They're the family lineages. They go back hundreds and hundreds of years because my history goes back to, I think 900. They went all the way back to the Valij clan, which means the fighting clan. We are the diplomats. We made sure the other tribes got along so that everybody was playing nicely. Well, I feel like that plays very well into what you do today. <laughs> yeah, 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 it does. <laughs> do you yeah, want to tell us a little bit more about that? I am a U.S. Army Special Forces Green Beret. I'm a warrant officer. I've been in now for 16 years. I started off as a 18 Delta, which is a Special Forces medic. And to label it short. We are military advisors. Uh, it's trying to categorize what my job entails, but every year has collectively been different than every other year. There's a new adventure. There's a new problem set. There's a new challenge. There's a new success. I used to change jobs before when I was a free range human before the army, I couldn't find a job that I wanted. I enlisted as a private into the army. I was 2006 and uh, I have not looked back since it's amazing. 
Every year feels like a new year and uh, the adventures are brand new. While my body may not claim that I've only been in the army for a year, but I feel like I've only been in the army for a year. That is fantastic. I mean, one, just to be a human being who feels like their job is that fresh and is that excited to do their work is fabulous, especially in the military as well. I don't find many people in the military who have that same kind of experience. Is this because of your particular role or your outlook? Mm -hmm. What makes the difference? Yeah, no, that, that, that's actually a great question. I was in ROTC in college from 2000 to 2003. I was about to be a lieutenant and had a year left where I had to commission. I was just like, you know what? This isn't what I want right now. And so I literally walked away from college, walked away from the scholarship and the army. I traveled a lot. And then I ended up over the course of a few years being a bartender in DC. That was a great job. I did that for about a year straight. And uh, the, the genesis of being a Green Beret was uh, one of the guys that would come in he was, you know, shaved face. He looked a little grumpy and I asked him, I was like, you know, what can I get you? He's like a steak and, and a bottle of wine. I was like, a glass? And he's like, no, the whole bottle. And I'm like, okay. So here's the bottle. He got him a steak. And uh, we talked, we had good banter. And then about six months later, a guy sits down in my bar. He's got a big beard. He's, you know, his, his, his arms are just rippled. He's tanned. I looked angry and frustrated. And I'm like, hey, what can I get you? And he's like, that same steak and the same wine that you got me six months ago. And I'm like, how do I know this guy? Over time, he became a regular. We started talking. and He told me all of his adventures. And he was a Green Beret. We're talking 2005 time frame when the war just started. You know, I was like, huh, it really sounds like there's a whole new aspect of life that I have no access to. And I never will unless I do what this guy does. And so I asked him about it. And he was like, yeah, you should go in. There's a special forces program where... You can go from the streets all the way to being a Green Beret. It's called the 18 X-ray contract. And uh, I went to the recruiter the very next day. And I was like, hey, you know, what can you tell me about the 18 X-ray contract? And the recruiter just shakes his head. I'm like, what? 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 What's wrong with the 18 X-ray contract? He's like, I've, I've sent seven. And I was like, okay, how many have made it? He's like, none. I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll be your eighth. And uh, he's like, okay. And so sign up and a month or two later, I ship out to Fort Benning, the airborne school, and then Fort Bragg. And you know, three years later, I came out with a Green Beret. And the first thing I did, I wrote a letter to that recruiter. I was like, hey, I made it. I don't know if he got it, but you know, at least I tried. It's a phenomenal adventure. I haven't looked back. I've definitely found myself in places in the world where I'm like, what, how did I get here? Like, how am I the only one here? Or, are we really about to do this? It's like, yeah, this is part of the job. You're like, okay, let's do this. It's exhilarating. It's amazing. You get to work with some phenomenal people. I've never met the type of people I work with because they also come from all walks of life. And they're also called to the spirit of adventure, you know, spirit of solving impossible problems. You get to know them and you realize that, hey, there's amazing people out there. And this seems to be where they congregate. It's like you all were drawn together by... Yeah. Is it the search for adventure or you're just particular kind of people who would be interested in this? What pulls you together? Well, everybody has their different motivations to enter the military. Um, some for the adventure, some for the challenge, some for the paper college. Uh, there seem to be a certain group of people that uh, see things differently in mm -hmm. the world and they know that they can apply their perspectives towards a solution that is more complicated to some, but for them, it just seems easy. And they're like, well, the answer's right here. Why can't we do it like this? Well, if we do it like that, that answers the problem. And that's amazing. And you just saved us years of effort. I, I was sharing a story with another friend and uh, they were like, that's amazing. And I kind of looked at him. I was like, yeah, but that's like every day to me because I work with other amazing people. So we exist in this little world of everybody has an amazing story or an amazing adventure, but because it's so commonplace to have that together, we lose sight of the awesome things that we're doing. Uh, and we just take it as normal as, at a certain point, which is both humbling as well as explaining what you've done or what problem you've solved in the world. Friends and family, they kind of look at me like, there's no way that story is true. And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, I have pictures. I have pictures. Like, it's true. I met this guy. And then we had this conversation and, you know, we solved that problem. And you're like, huh. 
Uh, and you just did it, especially my mom. I love my mom, but she's like, what do you do again? I was like, I'm a military advisor. I go to countries and I solve complicated problems and I work with partners and, and encourage them to solve their own problems. She's like, that doesn't make sense to me. I was like, that's okay, mom. Like, can, can I have some more pierogi? <laughs> the only job that's kept me interested for 16 years. So there's got to be something to it. I absolutely love that idea of having people who are of high quality solving problems, but do it in simple ways. I actually was interested in becoming a Marine when I was younger because I wanted the challenge. I wanted to be around a higher yeah. caliber. And so I get that. I get that culture. There's also different cultures when it comes to the military, but that one in particular is just so exhilarating. I bet you have some incredible stories and know some people, as you were saying, if we heard their stories, if we know who they were, it'd be like, and you just sat down and had lunch with this guy? Like, how does yeah. that happen? There are people too at the end of the day. It's amazing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I found that when you can humanize people and mm. bring them down to a level, we're all humans. We all eat, we all sleep and see people through that lens. It's so much easier and it's a lot more accessible to reach out to anyone. And then you mm -hmm. can start forming opportunities and you just make things happen versus uh, putting barriers between yourself and others because yeah. you feel insufficient or they feel off limits or something like that. Yeah, um, that's a great point. Um, I have found that some of my best we'll call them diplomatic successes is where you just walk over, shake the person's hand because you know that they may be as equally nervous as you are. And you're like, hey, how's it going? How are the kids? You guys play soccer? Like, what are we doing later? And you just don't talk about work in a work capacity and put the person first. And the work will get done. It doesn't have to get done at that moment. Put the person first realize that they have feelings and like you said they wake up and they get dressed too and they eat food they're as human as we are what i've seen is that some people have a barrier and they don't recognize that that person's a person because of a culture because of a language and that can make things a little bit more complicated but i think once you cross that barrier you can get down to business and some amazing things can happen yeah. And we can take it either way. Sometimes we put people up on a pedestal and sometimes mm. we demean them as less than human, right? So when we can just yeah. bring it back to the balance, uh, I think it's good. Any other tips on diplomacy? I realize there must be a ton that you know when you're oh. advising different <laughs> countries. And... Uh, it depends on where you go and you know what you're bringing to the table. Starting with an honest dialogue is a very interesting approach. I've succeeded more in complicated situations where I've met with a host nation colonel general and said, hi, you know, my name's Yatsik. Uh, I'm, I'm a warrant officer of this team and I don't fully understand what's going on here, but you do. So um, how can we help? You know, how do you see us fitting into this problem? They usually look at us and they're like, well, that's interesting because all the other military people or Americans that have come in have told us what they're going to do for us and what we're going to do for them. You're the first person actually collaborating. Um, and they're like, well, it's your country, it's your language, it's your people. It's fundamentally your problem that we're here to assist you to, fi to fix or to adjust. But to approach any problem set thinking that you have all the answers, it's not the best approach, especially in a diplomatic situation. It's so simple, but it's so powerful to just remember that you're coming to support someone else. So find mm -hmm. out what their needs are. What do you need? Yeah, it's, How can I help? it's you know, if you're a, a repairman showing up to, you know, fix somebody's house, you don't just show up and start fixing the house. You actually talk to the owner and ask him what is broken. How can we fix it? What's your budget? If you apply that same approach, it's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to yeah. go to some rapid fire questions. Polish or English? Uh, I speak English and Russian and Polish. Pierogies or pizza? Uh, pierogi all the way. Mm. What's the stuffing? What's inside? My favorite is onion and meat. And then you throw them on the fryer a little bit. And so they get browned mm -hmm. and uh, you throw uh, chopped bacon on top of that. It's phenomenal. I have, I, I've only ever found it in Poland. I've never found it in America. Maybe if I went to Chicago, but it's, it's the best. I can't believe this because in America, I have had the meat and onion, but I have never had bacon. And when I think of all countries to put bacon yeah. on anything, like what, why are we it's not? Little, bacon? Little, 
wrinkles of bacon. It's like heaven. Oh my goodness. I love the cheese ones, but I don't know yeah. now you've just set a new bar. Yeah. Well, it's an adventure, right? You gotta, you gotta go out there and try them all. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we talked about favorite places you've traveled. You've got mm -hmm. Sweden and Kenya and a bunch of other ones in there. When I think about traveling to a new country and understanding their culture, part of that is sports. So soccer mm. or football? Uh, I will go with soccer. My, okay. kids, my kids are very much into soccer right now. They will play for three, four hours, even out back, just shooting at the garage. And the garage is a big goal for them. So, that, I mean, yeah, we're a soccer family now. Do you have a particular team you cheer for? Um, I'll support local and go with the uh, Colorado Switchbacks. Nice. Yeah, 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 that's pretty good. I love watching soccer and then getting empanadas. It's my favorite oh. combination. Okay. What's your favorite team? Um, you know, I don't have one. I will watch anything. Nice. I'm, yeah, I'm just down for a good game. That's yeah. always the best. Yeah, it is. Okay. Movies or books? What are you into now? Uh, just finished writing a book. So I haven't been able to read any books in the past couple of weeks. So I've been focusing entirely on that effort. Wait, you wrote a book. Uh, yeah. The Genesis is Afghanistan. Uh, we were working 20 hours a day. We were the last Green Beret team in Helmand right before Afghanistan collapsed. And so it's kind of like that feeling I would imagine if you were driving across the bridge and behind you, the bridge is collapsing. And you're like, this is getting very fast. Uh, drive faster. <laughs> but we were still there. We were still trying to hold the country together, or at least the, the province together. Some people, they like to learn how to play guitar. They like to read. They like to watch movies, play Xbox. That's how they decompress. And, uh, the way my mind works is it never gets out of sixth gear. And so I was living in a 20 feet by eight feet metal box, a bed and uh, a dresser and a desk. Every night I'd go there and the only way I could decompress was by writing. Um, because prior to that, I tried to read a book. They had these big dusty libraries because you know, people had been there for 20 years. And I was like, okay, I don't want to read a history book. I don't want to read a thriller. I don't want to read a book about war right now. I am fundamentally like a romantic at heart. And uh, I picked up a romance book and I was like, I can't read this. This isn't written for me. And so I was like, maybe I could write this. It's a romantic book of a Green Beret in his second chapter of life. And uh, it's written in a way that there's the romantic element, but where a guy could appreciate reading it. So that all came together and I created another world to live in. And then I'd go to sleep and I'd wake up and I'd be in Afghanistan and then I'd come back. I'd write another chapter or two and then I would just cycle this for a couple months and yeah, you know, I put it away. And then a couple months ago, I picked it back up and I was like, hey, this is actually pretty good. Like I should probably finish this. So that's been my project. I finally got to a place where I like it and uh, he's publishing here soon. Yay, that's so <laughs> exciting. <laughs> it is exciting. It's, it's, it's one of those, you know, Check the block type things, but yeah, I rather enjoyed writing. I'll be retiring in a couple of years and maybe I'll adventure into that realm of the world. That so. is incredible. I could imagine that after, you know, a long day in Afghanistan, you have to have some way to decompress. You were naming some yeah. of the ways other people chose writing. What experience does that create for you? How does it emotionally and mentally decompress you? Imagine that you wake up in the morning and you go into work. Um, and every hour could be different or there could be catastrophe, a calamity, something amazing happen. Your stress levels are just going up and down, up and down, just even throughout the day. If you just like, Hey, I'm going to go out for lunch. You walk across the street, grab lunch, come back. And everybody could be in, in the, uh, the situation room, uh, because something amazing or something big is happening and it, it could transpire in the course of a second. For me, what I found is. At the end of the day, I'll have those feelings and those feelings and emotions, they have to go somewhere because if they don't, they just sit within you. Did you notice a difference between you and maybe teammates who didn't have a way to get some of this stuff out or didn't pick a way? At this level of work, everybody I work with is very smart, very capable, very savvy. Um, and we also look out for each other. We recognize especially nowadays that there's different levels of wounds. They're not all physical. Stress can become a wound. We do a really good and very intentional job of looking out for each other. I mean, because a special forces team, there's 12 guys and we're the only ones there. And in Helmand, it was us 12 
and then 10,000 Afghans. That's a very isolating event, and you learn to lean on each other for jokes and for comfort and for adventure and for trust. And uh, in a very manly way, you learn to love these guys as a loving team that's willing to fight and die for each other. There's something poetically beautiful about that. Yeah, absolutely. I would imagine some of that same feel is what's woven into your book. Oh, that's a really good insight. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to say yes, but I definitely would reread it and be like, oh, this happened in real life or a version of this happened in real life. So I did draw from that. Yeah, that's a good insight. Earlier, I heard that you were the last Green Beret in Helmand. Yeah. And so we were. And what was actually really interesting with that was uh, National Geographic was following us for six months when we were in Afghanistan. They were trying to capture what it's like to get ready for a mission and go into a mission. So we deployed and we didn't even know Afghanistan was going to collapse. So what they inadvertently captured was the collapse of Afghanistan. And it's going to be interesting, a documentary on that. It's coming out sooner than later, but it's not out yet. They filmed us on all walks of life, us going to the chow hall or shaving or playing golf or burning some time. I wonder what made it in there because they captured all of it. And so it's going to be interesting kind of looking back on ourselves. Uh, that's going to be the philosophical kind of self-awareness thing. Like, oh, that's what I look like when I'm busy and working and haven't slept in two days. <laughs> I'm excited to see it uh, just because of what it could end up meaning and representing. Because it was effectively the closeout of a 20-year war. So that's going to be an epic historical vantage point, especially from a special operations vantage point. What do you hope the main message is? Oh, wow. That we did our job to the very end. We may not have had all the right answers at that moment, but we're as human as the person standing next to us. And we made the best decision we could with what we knew at the time. Well, maybe in a deeper sense. After 20 years of war, especially in Afghanistan, as complicated as that place was, if we can maybe give some closure to somebody or some insight, like, because I think about it, I have two young boys. And so if they can put a degree of reality to what dad does when he's gone for six months, it's like, oh, he does work. And this is a version of that work. And this is why he does it. Maybe it'll explain things to them a little more. If that can also provide some closure, some insight, and some value to another family, then that was worth it. So multiple layers, not only for your own family of explaining, this is what dad does, this is where he's been. Mm -hmm. I could imagine families with other people who've been in, and maybe even families who've lost someone. Sometimes it doesn't make sense why it's happening. So maybe mm -hmm. the story can share a little bit more. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping it does. Let's chat a little bit more about your family. You were born in Poland. How did you end yeah. up in America? Oh, yeah. This was one of those things that people look at me and they raise an eyebrow. They're like, that's not possible. I was like, no, it's absolutely possible. I was born in uh, Poland right when martial law happened back in the early 80s. And my dad, Leszek Waliszewski, was a co-founder for Solidarity, the movement that eventually kicked communism out of Poland. I have pictures of him in Lech Wałęsa, the, the, the first president of Poland. They've got their big, bushy 70s era mustaches. And yeah, they're all looking over paperwork and documentation. They're literally planning out this resistance movement, which by a lot of metrics was one of the most successful in history because it was nonviolent. So I didn't meet my dad because he was arrested. My mom got pregnant and he was arrested and put in jail. And I didn't meet him until I was six months old. It was funny because my mom said she would take Solidarity propaganda papers and put them in my diaper and uh, smuggle them in and out of jail that way, just hoping that I didn't pee on them. She learned this technique because as soon as he got arrested, the Babushka network went out and they said, Leszek got arrested at the train station. And my mom's like, oh no, because she's got propaganda papers on the dinner table. So she stuffs them together and then she hears the, the boot jacks coming up the uh the apartment complex stairwell as she knows they're coming for her so she grabs them she shoves them in my diaper knowing that that's probably the only place the communists aren't going to look 
And she was right. They tore out all the cupboards, flipped all the couches, and they were looking for reasons to even arrest her. My first act in a resistance movement was as a smuggler. <laughs> when he did finally meet me, they were in the cell block and he holds me up. And he's like, this is, this is proof the resistance movement will live on. I first thought that was a little dramatic, but uh, the more I learned about the situation, you know, the, the Soviets were on the border. They were prepared to reinvade Poland. Um, the Polish government at that time was considering trading out all the solidarity leaders to the Soviets where they would have been executed. To be the you know, firstborn son of a resistance founder, that carries both a lot of weight and a lot of weight that I can't carry and live up to. I can just enjoy knowing that that's part of my lineage. That's a huge historic, uh, historic genesis. And I'm just being proud to be even remotely related to that. When they found out that I was born, the prisoners got together and they ripped up an a old bed sheet in the prison. And it's got the Polish eagle on there. And they wrote out, congratulations to Leszek Waliszewski for the birth of the son. And so I, I have a prison birth certificate. My mom at that point, she was aware of what was going on. So she went to the American embassy and filed for refugee status for political refugees. And the Reagan administration, I think they knew who my father was and the hierarchy of the solidarity movement. And so we went to East Germany, then West Germany, and then uh, we moved to North Carolina. And um, yeah, it was an epic, epic adventure. We landed with two suitcases and 200 bucks and no one spoke English. I think in line with your podcast, what I'm realizing is that, that was an opportunity at that point. Like you have nothing, so where do you go? Well, you go up, you go forward. That's, that's your chance. That's all you get, you know? Uh, my dad worked two jobs as a painter and computer repairman. My mom was cleaning houses and then the Polish community at that time just bound together and we all took care of each other. Now that I'm at my age and I'm reflecting on my kids, I'm like, that's terrifying. Imagine jumping on a plane with the alternative of being traded out to the Soviets behind you. You're like, you're going to go to a country and you don't speak the language and here's a couple bucks. So good luck. Yeah. Not a lot of people, I think, could pull that off today. That is an incredible opportunity. And yeah. as you said, you can only go up. I mean, at that point, you have nothing. You have no ties. You have no community. So you can only right. build from there. My father got a business degree, started working for General Motors. He worked his way up the chain. Uh, and he got to the point where he was handpicked to help found the Saturn plant in Tennessee. And then when the wall fell in the nineties, they turned to him and they're like, yeah, do you want to go back to Poland and open up some emerging markets? And I was like, yeah, let's do that too. What's interesting is that my, my older sister, she's a Colonel in the army. She's a strong proponent of the suicide awareness programs. And she helps create those and fund those. And she's hyper successful. She briefed the secretary of defense. I think last week she was handpicked. She was asked to come brief him. Then my brother, who's four years younger than me, has got an app, a travel app, very successful, uh, self-made type businessman. Uh, I give them all the credit. And then I was like, wait, no, I've accomplished a few things too. You know, like so the, the central point to that is I think what we accidentally or inadvertently learned by growing up with my father as he was struggling to find the next job, learn English. And not only learn English, learn business English. He taught us that every situation uh, can go one of two ways. It can go in a positive or negative. Winston Churchill says a, pe a pessimist sees a problem in every situation, and then an optimist sees an opportunity, right? So the theory isn't new, but seeing that embodiment in my father, okay, we have 200 bucks and we're going to figure it out. And we're going to turn every situation into an opportunity and every situation has best as possible into a positive. I think what we as kids learn from him and seeing him struggle and succeed is that if you get it right seven times out of 10, you're still getting it right. Uh, I laugh because there's a joke, a guy pulls up to a gas station and he sees that the lottery is a million dollars. And he's like, I want to win that million dollars. So the next day he checks the lottery ticket numbers and he didn't win. He's like, oh, okay, maybe I got to make this better. So he pulls up a gas station and he's like, all right, if I win the lottery, I'm going to give 10% to charity. And so the next day he checks those lottery numbers. He doesn't win. He's like, okay, maybe I got to make it better. So he goes the next day. He's like, if I win the lottery today, 
I'm going to give 50% to charity. He doesn't win. So finally, at the end of it, he's like, I just want to say that I won the lottery. I'll give all 100% of it to charity. Okay, is that cool? Why won't you let me win the lottery? So God, or the non-denominational Jesus, whoever, he reaches down, rips the roof off the car. He looks at the guy and he's like, well, at least go in and buy a ticket. I laugh about it, but I realize that a lot of people have the same outlook on life. They're like, I really want that thing. I really want a good job. I really want a nice house. I really want, you know, to whatever, to lose weight, to be healthy, to financially savvy and set. And they can see the lottery ticket and they can see how much it's worth if they win it. And they just sit in the car or they're like, ah, it's hot outside and I've got the AC on in here, you know, where they get out and they walk across the asphalt and they go into the store and then they just don't buy the lottery ticket or they talk themselves out of the ticket. I know it's a lighthearted joke, but what I'm realizing is we're correlating the two is if you use that analogy and apply it to life, if you get one out of five things right in life, that's great. Learn from that. And next time get two out of five things right. You know, but like it's going to take you getting out of your car and walking across the street of life and walking into the store of life and gambling a little bit in life and saying, yeah, like I might have to take a different job or I don't like this situation. So I need to go figure out a way to, you know, it might be uncomfortable to figure out a way, but I need to figure out a way to solve it because that's the problem. You're identifying the problem. And I think what my dad taught us was that walking across into the gas station and getting a lotto ticket is part of life. You know, go get a lotto ticket, get the next lotto ticket, get the next lotto ticket. And, you know, if, uh, if you invest small, you'll get small. If you invest big, you, you might win big. He would say, this is you know, of one, of the, one of his funny quotes. He's like, uh, the harder I work, the luckier I got. Because people would ask how he got where he did. And he was like, well, I was painting houses and repairing computers. That's not a money maker, but that was my scratch off ticket. And then that, and then bigger, and then bigger, and then bigger. And he taught my sister and my brother and myself, you just try to do the right thing at that moment. Um, and you see the positive aspect instead of the pessimistic aspect. But you do one positive thing a day for X amount of days, you're going to be better off. Like now that we're reflecting on it, I think some people won't even get out of the car. They'll just sit there and be angry that somebody else won a lottery ticket. But that's an opportunity. And what you do with that is up to the person. When you were young, as a kid, seeing your family come to America, you only have $200 or so. And then your parents are starting to rebuild their lives. At that point in time, did you see that optimistic attitude? Did you see the behavior in the flesh, so to speak? Or is it only well, now reflecting upon it? It's only now reflecting on it. Because... No one loves living in a small apartment and eating cold ravioli because the microwave is broken or hot dogs, right? There's nothing to love about that. And that's the other thing is if you don't love something about the situation you're in, be creative enough to solve it, right? And so it's like, hey, we don't like this apartment because it's small and it's tiny and we don't have any money. And it's like, all right, time to make money, time to not spend money, time to get a certain certification and work up the ladder. The funny thing with perspective, because I think that's what we're getting to, is opportunities based on perspective. You have to see the opportunity first to then work towards it. Everybody's heard the glass is half full and glass is half empty. It's not enough just to see that the glass is half full or half empty, but is it being filled up or is it being emptied? If you're going through life emptying your glass, of course it's going to be half empty. But if it's half full, it can only get fuller growing up as a kid. Because we moved around a lot. I think I went to six or eight different schools by the time I was in ninth grade because we were chasing the career ladder that GM had put out in front of my dad. And that could be very pessimistic and frustrated that every year I was leaving and going to different schools and didn't know anybody. But I took a different approach. And I was like, well, I'm just moving. I'm in Texas and there's longhorn steer in my backyard. I'm like, that's cool. Let's get to know some cows. I'm in Michigan where... I learned to make igloos because it snowed every weekend in the winter. So I moved around it. But one of my best friends, uh, you know, I knew him in North Carolina and we were still best friends now as adults. I knew him back in second grade. I and mean, we love catching up with each other just because it's great to hear and share these stories of successes. And then 90s rolled around and the GM's like, do you want to move to Poland? And we're like, let's go. This is a chance. We don't know what's going to come of it. No one does. You can't predict that far. But as a teenager, 
I was living life in Europe. I was like, I want to go snowboarding in Slovakia. Like my buddies are going. My dad's like, yeah, go. It's only 20 bucks on a train to get there. I'm meeting other Europeans. I think I spent two weeks in Tokyo as a teenager. Because my girlfriend at the time used to live there and still had friends. So like all I had to do was buy a plane ticket. And I spent weeks there. I could have focused on, I'm an American. I don't speak the language fluently. Or I could say, what opportunities exist? Let's focus on the things that I can learn from this situation. Let's not focus on the parking lot that I'm going to have to walk across to get into the store to buy the lottery ticket. Let's just focus on the lottery ticket. And whatever it takes to get there, let's just chalk that up as stuff we have to do to get there. That's what I learned at a very young age, and that stuck with me. And I think that mapped very much my trajectories in life. This, this one's funny. We were in Germany at the time. And a couple of my buddies and I were sitting around talking. And we were like, hey, they're running with the bulls this weekend in Pamplona. And it's only like 50 euro to fly there. Let's go. We go to Pamplona. And we run with the bulls. And then Spain wins the World Cup that night. Well, that's amazing, right? Uh, couldn't have predicted that. And we get back to work on Monday. And uh, we're like, oh, yeah, we ran with the bulls. And then we partied in Barcelona. <laughs> We had a newspaper and we were like, look, like, you know, it's in the newspaper. We ran to the bulls and we're looking. I'm like, huh, that's me in the newspaper. I started laughing. And now that I'm thinking about it, it's like when you put yourself out there into the adventures of life and you're like, yeah, let's do it. Let's focus on the adventure, on the good that's going to come of it. Like there's a picture proving that a spontaneous weekend and the bulls jumping over me. Yeah. You know? And it's like, ha, huh, that could not have been predicted, could not have been planned. And it couldn't be proven because you're not allowed to take pictures while you're running with the bulls. And now there's proof of it. You're like, huh. It's sort of like fate or someone's congratulating you as you go. You're like, yeah, you did the hard thing. Congratulations. You bought that lottery ticket. Not only did you win one lottery ticket, you won two. And you're like, oh, well, I didn't predict that. Yeah, you're not supposed to predict it. You're just supposed to play the lottery of life and move forward, fall forward, learn from your mistakes. There's no such thing as opportunity without the effort, right? No one said it's going to be easy. No one said you're going to get there. And no one said that it's guaranteed. If you think about any of it, like those propaganda papers hadn't been shoved in my diaper and smuggled into prison for the solidarity unit to know what they were doing and then smuggle papers out. Who knows what would have happened? The opportunity was there and someone took that opportunity and they worked hard for it. And there are no guarantees, but life is a one-way street. You might as well Try to win as many lottery tickets as you can along the way, right? Absolutely. It seems like application is the key. I think that's what you're driving at is just get out there, yeah. go and do, and you don't know what's going to happen. But if you don't do that, we absolutely know what's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. If you're playing poker in Vegas and you never put a chip out, you're never going to be able to play poker. You have to put a chip out. And then maybe you win the hand. Maybe you don't win the hand. I think people get into this fear that, oh, this is my only chip. If I put it out and lose, what next? It's like, well, if you actually think about it, you have an unlimited pocket of chips because it's your life. Like the chips only run out when your life is over. But if you don't take a chip and gamble just a little bit of discomfort and try to play strategically and try to win that pot, then you're never going to make more money. You're just going to have what you have. And that's it. Yeah. The application of effort when you see an opportunity when you can see a chance for adventure or growth or enlightenment. I was talking to my kids. They'd lost their iPad the other day. And, uh, like, well, it's not here on the couch. What do I do? I was like, well, you just keep looking for it. They looked for it and looked for it and they found it finally. But I think in some ways people tend to do that too. They're like, well, my, my solution's not right here in front of me. Where do I go from here? I, I'm just never going to have an iPad again. It's like, or you could just look under the couch or maybe in the bed or maybe in the car. Or maybe in the kitchen or maybe at your friend's house like the opportunity the chance it exists you just have to find it and you have to be persistent enough to find it you have to be persistent at lottery and just because you have one opportunity doesn't mean you've won forever you have to get the next one the next one the next one also i think what's important is accepting the fact that you're not going to capture every opportunity you're going to look back and be like oh i missed that one you have to give yourself the grace on not getting it right saying okay I messed this one up, sit back, lick your wounds, objectively identify why you missed it. Did you not prepare well enough? Did you not plan well enough? Did you not talk to enough people? Or was the timing just bad? Next time this presents itself, I'll do it again. And I'll try to do it a little better. If I get it, 
I'm going to appreciate it that much more. I think that's the very thing that a lot of people get so scared of is mm. needing it to be right. I need to figure out before I even get out of that car to go purchase that proverbial lotto ticket. I need yeah. to know what kind do I need to buy? How much is it going to cost me? What are my odds? And figure everything out. And then I can apply myself. And that's backwards. There actually was a study of this group of students. They split them in two. They had students who made one clay pot in the span of 30 days. And so they worked on that clay pot over 30 days. Then on the other side, the group of students created a clay pot every single day. So they had 30 clay pots at the end. And then yeah. they had an assessment of which one was a higher quality pot. And the group that created one every single day for 30 mm -hmm. days ended up with the highest quality pot at the end. Yeah. So application, right? As many right. times yeah, yeah. You learn more by doing than by studying to do it. You should always have a general plan of like, do I have enough money to get on this plane to go to Spain? But all reasonable abilities aside, doing is more important than thinking about doing. Once you go through infantry airborne, then you go to special forces, you go to selection. Um, they throw us on a truck, they're 50 pound rucksacks, and they drop us off in this random intersection in the woods. Go that way. You have an undetermined amount of distance to travel over an undetermined amount of time. If you make it at the end of it, you can continue being selected and evaluated. We're like, okay, let's go. And then I see, see this guy to my side. He's kind of confused. We're like, is everything okay? He's like, I thought we were in special forces now. We're like, no, no, no. We have to be selected to be in special forces. We have to still try. And he's like, oh. And he just takes off his rucksack and sits down. He's like, yeah, that's too much work. And we're like, oh, oh, okay, well, you made your decision. We're going to go. And so going, we went. And I mean, 250, 300 miles later, over the course of like two, three weeks, I mean, my feet were bloody and you've lost like 10 pounds. And you've seen some of the strongest people. They call it self-selection is when you have so much internal doubt that you're just like, nope, I can't make this anymore. I can't do it. You'd be like, but you're in much better health. You have zero blisters. I have like eight and they're this big. They're on my feet. My feet are bleeding. You know, you're like, okay, well, that person has made their decision. My decision is to continue going and I will continue going. And, uh, that's the effort, right? You have to keep trying and then back to the clay pot analogy. You have to try every day, for 30 days and you'll get somewhere. If you just show up and say, Hey, today's the day I make it. You're like, ah, did you try? Did you work to get here? People are going to battle instant gratification with effort. And there's that frustration because a lot of people want the instant gratification without the effort. Now, I sound like an old person saying this, but the more I reflect on life is I've never achieved anything in life that I didn't apply for. That translates into, we have to go all in on making this clay pot today and make it the best we can today. It doesn't have to be the best tomorrow. It doesn't have to be the best from yesterday, but using, using your analogy is yeah, the best one today, the best we can do today. Sometimes that's all it takes. And then you get to the next day because time's linear. Time goes forward. Well, one thing I'm hearing in your story is you had people, let's say, who didn't have blisters and you have eight blisters. Mm -hmm. We could classify that as you are having a more challenging experience than they are. And I've heard before that sometimes people who come from more challenging pasts, they have what it takes to push forward to greater opportunities. Now, I don't mm. think that's necessarily true all the time, mm -hmm. but it does create a little bit of a character that is willing to dig in deep, willing to have that grittiness and mm. push through. How important do you think having challenges in life is for obtaining opportunities? There's a balance, like you said, with, within reasonability, right? Um, because the person's mind is always learning. It's like going to the gym. If you go to the gym one day and you say, today's the day I'm going to work out and lift a thousand pounds, you're not going to get anywhere because it's impossible. But if you say today's the day I'm going to lift what I can lift and I'll add 10 pounds to it tomorrow. That's the challenge. That's the difficulty. And I'm going to add 10 pounds the next week and 10 pounds the next week. You add difficulty in a workout to get stronger, right? Same in life. An easy life doesn't actually teach you anything. It accelerates your chances to have an existential crisis because you're like, life is so easy. What's my purpose? And then you're like, oh, well, your purpose is to find challenge. You're like, ah, no, I don't know if I like challenge because I've had such an easy life. But conversely, there are terrible things in this world. And if, if, 
know, that life or that person is put under too much pressure, the same as if they were at the gym, they would tear a muscle or hurt their back. And that could be a lifelong injury. So yeah, there's absolutely truth to the idea of yeah, either voluntarily putting yourself into challenging situations or finding yourself in challenging situations and then not quitting and continuing through it. Uh, there was nothing easy about growing up as an immigrant with a funny name like Yatsik uh, in North Carolina, in Tennessee, or in Texas. They're like, Yatsik, where's that from? Are you a foreigner? I'm like, yeah, I'm American because I was naturalized, but that's still my name. Trying to find yourself in that and move forward, it was never catastrophic, but it was always challenging. But then once anybody shifts their perspective and says, yeah, it's challenging, but what am I learning from it? It's difficult, but what am I learning today from it? How will tomorrow be better? Being honest with yourself, you get to a point where if you don't like the situation, what fortunately you've done is you've created a catalog of life skills. And you're like, oh, I can, I can move tomorrow. That's okay. I'll move from here to there. And people are like, how are you going to do that? That sounds scary. And you're like, no, if I've moved like every year for my past 10 years, I'm just going to pack my bag and jump on a Greyhound. This is nothing. You know, difficult things can train you to solve more difficult things, but there is a balance. Like you said, um, if it's too difficult. It's crushing, but if it's too easy, it doesn't teach you anything. When you were a kid, it feels like you got a sense for that. You mm -hmm. changed your perspective. Was that, how did you come to that conclusion? Was it something that moved within you? Was it the lessons from your family, the modeling from your dad? Uh, I was, eight, nine, 10, I was still a young kid. So I don't think I had the maturity to look at my dad and be like, oh, that, that man's going to teach me something and I'm, I'm going to learn it right now. Within me, uh, it was just this real simple question of like, I'm moving, who do I want to be and what do I want to achieve next? Um, cause I had the ability to be basically like a social chameleon. I would leave in the middle of the school year and show up at the you know, next school. And be like, I could be whoever I want to be. These people don't know who I am. You know, I can be the shy guy. I can be the uh, extravagant guy. I can be the guy who just minds his own business because I'm probably going to be moving next year anyway. I had every reason to be frustrated, but what I was learning is that I didn't want to live in frustration. If you have a choice to be frustrated or not frustrated, it only makes sense to choose what's going to make you happier. I learned how to know people very quickly. I learned how to make friends very quickly. Uh, there was obviously the struggle of learning how to do that because you know, with a bunch of kids who've been with each other forever, live in the same neighborhood, same house. And I'm the new, I'm like, how do I get to know that group of friends? Or how do I avoid those people? You know, cause they're going to beat me up. I think instinctively learned and then intentionally, uh, designed myself to be able to see those things and then move quickly between those groups. And I mean, in high school, I could just move in between each group very fluidly. I walked up to them as if they were the humans that they were. I didn't approach them with any preconceptions. I was like, Hey, how's it going? Hey, you're having a problem with that group. What's going on? Okay, cool. Don't do that, but do do this. I'd make sure the school is as balanced as possible because I was building out my, my own situation. I wanted the school to be happy, go lucky and everybody having a good time because that was a choice. I'm like, Hey, let's, let's just make sure everybody gets along. Like it's, it's easy. It's easy to get along. Like we'll just squash little fights before they happen. I mean, now that we're, I'm talking about it is clearly spilled over <laughs> into my adult life. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, somewhere in there, uh, th there was absolutely a conscious decision to say, I have a choice. I have a choice of being frustrated or I have a choice of trying to find the best in the situation and learn from that. I modeled it to fit what I needed it to do. I love that you have that epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I was thinking about this, I was like, wait a second, as I'm talking about this, I'm realizing that, that this is hilarious. So. <laughs> I was like, wow, there's so many parallels between his childhood and his work. And then you said, I think I'm having an epiphany. And I was like, oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So for anyone who is just stuck, they have a ton of self-doubt Hmm. feel like they don't have resources. What, what am I going to bring to the table? What am I good at? How am I supposed to create an opportunity? How do I even start? I've been in those situations where you have a great idea or you have a great desire and you're like, I just don't even know. And if you overthink it, then you'll give yourself anxiety. 
because you're like, oh, there's so many things to do. I can't possibly do them all today. And the answer is you're absolutely correct. There's no way you're going to get it done today. And you're not supposed to get it done today. It's impossible to get it done today. So don't set yourself up to do it. But what you can set yourself up for is look for other people who've done it. Um, it is amazing how much information is in a book. I mean, I read Richard Branson's, all of his interviews, his autobiographies, uh, Tony Robbins. You get this collection of knowledge of how other people have done it because they've done it. And they want to then share how they've done it because they're eternal optimists. And somewhere in there is the answer. Give yourself the grace that you're not going to figure it out all today. And then say, hey, I'm going to look at other people who've done it, and I'm just going to study them. I'm going to read a book. That's your effort. That's you getting out of the car. Then you putting in the effort of changing something that you're doing to model towards the target or the goal that you want, which is the, the, the theoretical lottery ticket. Because Tony Robbins and Richard Branson and even Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos, you have people who are going to criticize them, right? But those are the people that are sitting in the car pointing at the other people going into the lottery store and being like, oh, look at those people. They're never going to win. I'm going to judge them from the inside of my car. Why are you going to give them grief for putting themselves out there? I mean, Elon Musk uh, has probably done more for the energy market and the electric car market than m anybody but there's still people who are like, oh, yeah, but there's this one thing that he did. And you're like, look, he's still human. He's still going to have flaws. But learn from him. And then more importantly, I just want to turn to that person. I'm like, what are you doing with your life? Are you trying to make electric cars? Are you trying to put solar panels on things? Are you trying to make battery banks? And are you sending satellites? And are you exploring the world? Or are you just sitting in your car complaining? Tying it back to the simplest of ideas is... If you are stuck somewhere, give yourself the grace to say, yeah, you're stuck. Don't beat yourself up. Admit to yourself. Give yourself that grace. Say, I'm stuck. Just say it. It's like taking the lid off a pot of boiling pasta. If you don't say it, then you're just going to bubble and shake. But if you take that off, you're going to let some steam off. And you're like, okay, okay, I can see the pasta now. Okay, it's not that bad. And then say, what do I want to achieve? And who else has achieved it? And I'm just going to learn from them. Because they've already gone that way. They've already learned those things. I'm going to make sure that I am not sitting there criticizing them for having achieved what they've achieved. Because everybody has a different journey. Everybody has a different start point. Everybody has a different day one. But if you don't take that first step, and if you don't take that first effort, you're never going to have a day two. You're just going to be stuck in that car complaining. So I sympathize with people who are stuck. Because I was stuck. I had my first midlife crisis when I was 20. Uh, I realized I was going bald. I can either have a really bad receding hairline or I could shave my head. And I turned to my sister. She's like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I don't know. You tell me what to do. She's like, I, I'm like, I guess I'm shaving my head from here on out. So seek advice from somebody else, knowing that sometimes they may not give you the best advice, but you know, start asking questions. Like, hey, have you ever been in this situation? Hey, this is what I'm going to walk into. Hey, I feel stuck. Um, I'm frustrated. I'm unhappy with my situation. I think some people, when they're stuck in a situation, they try to tell themselves, no, 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 I need to just learn to be okay with this. And you're like, no, that's not the purpose of realizing that you're unhappy. The purpose of realizing you're unhappy is to motivate you to make yourself happy because being happy is a choice. And so, yeah, my kids are very unhappy when they're, they lose their iPad. And they're very happy when they find it uh, because they've put in the effort to find it. They don't want to just sit around and be unhappy. Uh, there's a significant degree of choice and personal responsibility to solving the problem directly in front of you. And then you can solve the next bigger problem and then the next bigger problem. So the short answer is give yourself grace, seek help, do research, try. Just try. Like you said, do those 30 clay pots, okay? Don't focus so hard on that one perfect clay pot because no one's going to do that. Your team's going to fall apart at day 20 because you've not made a clay pot yet. You guys are all sharing the same anxiety. And that's just not how you know, humans' body and spirit and effort and life is engineered. It's engineered to go out and try. I've given you a very long answer to a very simple question, but I feel very passionate about that. So that was good, good on your part. Me too. And I just think one of the easiest entry points 
for anyone. It doesn't matter how much money, if you're in a small apartment, you're in a mansion, you're in the middle of your life and you feel like you haven't done anything, you don't know what your purpose is, go to someone else and say, what can I do better? It takes humility to accept that advice because no one wants to be told that they are deficient in something, you know? And so, you know, you have to be ready for that. I think another issue that we have in society is we take anyone who has been successful and we put them up on a pedestal. And then mm -hmm. sometimes when they're on the pedestal, we'll try and tear them down, but not to bring them back to our level, but just to tear them down. When mm -hmm. we put them on a pedestal, it increases the distance between where we are and where they are. And it makes mm -hmm. the journey feel incredibly long versus realizing the simplicity. If you want to walk a path, you have to start with that first step. And so yeah. if you're looking to get wherever they are, just take a step and, and people say, okay, great. So I took a step. Now what? Like I'm still so far from X, yeah. Y, and Z person or X, Y, and Z goal. Yeah. And yet I think you and I can relate and we understand we've gotten to where we are because we just kept taking steps. Life takes effort and energy and it's not going to be found sitting on a couch, you know, or mm -hmm. sitting in a car. That's a beautiful way to put it. When you have reached out to someone or you took that next step or you applied yourself in a way and that leads to the next opportunity and then the next and then the next mm -hmm. and things are building, how do you know when you've maximized an opportunity and it's time to pivot and start looking for opportunities somewhere else? Well, that's a hard question to answer. I took one job. I was in North Carolina. This was my transition after college. But before going back into the army, I answered this ad, it pays 20 bucks an hour and you milk cows. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So I show up to this farm field and the farmer looks at me. He's like, I don't even know why you're here. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you're not going to ever do this job. I was like, okay, that's fine. The mud's up to your ankles and it just smells like manure. And I'm like, okay, but I've never milked a cow. Like you're absolutely right. Farmer Joe, I don't want this job. <laughs> I'm agreeing with you, but I've never milked a cow. So can I milk a cow for like a shift? He's like, yeah, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard, but do it. And uh, so I just started milking cows, putting up the suction cups and just being covered in slop. But being honest with yourself and saying, this is absolutely not what I want right now. This isn't the job that I'm going to force myself to take. What I found myself doing, being very honest with myself, with work and with positions of work and places I go to, is like, no, this isn't, this isn't right. I'm listening to myself and this is absolutely not what I want to do or this isn't the way it should be done. And then I look around and I'm like, well, no one else is fixing it. So I'm going to try to fix it and make it better. When you've got that internal monologue in, within yourself, it's about giving yourself the grace and the honesty um, to say, that's not what I want to do anymore. I encourage you with my voice. I'm like, well, if you don't like it, change it, fix it or move on. It's such simple advice. And I'm telling that to a nine year old and a seven year old, but I'm seeing adults do the same thing. There was a brief stint where I was an accountant right before joining the army. I sat down and started doing accounting numbers and I'm like, well, no, this isn't going to work for me. <laughs> and it was paying me a phenomenal amount of money. Uh, I turned to the guy next to me who I just met. I'm like, how long have you been doing this? He's like, oh, like a couple of years. I'm like, and you like it? He's like, no, I hate it. I'm like, why would you choose to do that then? And time comes by and I'm like, yeah, I'm leaving. And they're like, well, you just started. I was like, yeah, but this isn't what I want to do. My life is more important than this job. Uh, you only have one life and it's going to be long or short and you have no control over that. So might as well make all of it as, as satisfying and as useful as possible. There is no easy answer other than if you don't like it, find something that you do like. If you get stuck, ask for help. There's people out there that'll help you. How do you pick a direction? Is it important to have a mission statement? Do you need to know your purpose or is it just pick one, go with it? get feedback from life, from the world, from inside yeah. yourself? I've never been a very smart learner. I'm a doer learner. So I have to go forward and stumble and be like, oh, I, I guess I got to learn how to walk, you know? I'm like, well, well so, so if this is good, but this is bad, you know, it's simple binary solution, I'm going to go this way. And you get there and you're like, okay, that's good. That's good. That's better. I'm going to go better. I think a mission statement can be overwhelming. I've worked or trained with over 1.2 and a half thousand foreign troops or other people in different cultures, in different languages, under many different circumstances. I've learned a lot about them, 
but I've also learned a lot about myself in the process. If you do that long enough, you're going to answer some questions that you didn't know you had. Uh, but fundamentally, most people only have one or two core motivations. They only have one or two core identities. Everything else is a construct around that. At least for me, what is my core motivation? What is my core identity? I, I need to figure it out. So I'm going to go out into a situation. I'm going to discover how I feel in that situation. I'm going to step back and like, oh, I like that about me or I don't like that about me. But being honest with yourself and saying, what did you like? What didn't you like? What embarrassed you? Where did you succeed? Where were you happiest? What were you proud of? Why were you proud of it? And answering these really mushy questions and then dial you in to identify what you want to do in life and how you want to get there and how you may want to get there. I think for a lot of different people, it's going to be a little different ways. Uh, the way I knew it for me is I'm going to go out and I'm going to do as much as I can in life while I'm still young enough to do it. Uh, I traveled a lot. Uh, I mean, and we're talking like I threw a backpack on and I got a Greyhound and I went to Canada to visit friends out there for a month. Like it doesn't have to be these like luxurious travel things. It's just how you just have to get there. My buddy once flew over from Poland and we jumped in my pickup truck, started in Knoxville, Tennessee, drove to DC all the way up to Canada through Toronto, all the way to Kansas, all the way to Tijuana. From Tijuana, we drove all the way up to Seattle. From Seattle, we went through Omaha and Nebraska and ended up back in Knoxville, Tennessee. And the instant we rolled back into the parking spot, my odometer clicked 10,000 miles. And he and I look at each other like, I'm glad we're young because I can't do that again when we're old. We learned, we visited friends along the way. We had a great adventure, but that's the point. If you don't put yourself into a situation, you're never going to learn who you are. If you're too scared to push yourself out of your comfort zones, you're never going to learn where you can grow. I could have been doing landscaping or milking cows. I prefer the life I have now. I have this theory that if everyone went through this process and just identified what do I like, what do I not like, and drew stronger boundaries around that, said no to mm. more things, yeah. that we would have accountants who would be milking cows and people who are milking cows who would be lawyers or whatever. Everyone would yeah. have this shuffle. And I feel like we're going through that a little bit. But it's so important for people to be honest and everything would still get done. People would just rearrange and I feel like people would be a lot more satisfied with it. There's some great people out there that should be doing and following their passions. Like, uh, congratulations to you for launching this podcast, for example. I have no idea how to launch a podcast, but I imagine there were more than a few steps and you've done it and you know, you're doing it, right? Like, that's a huge win. There's probably 50,000 people behind you being like, oh, I want to launch a podcast, but I don't know what microphone to use. Or I want to launch a podcast, but I don't know who I'd interview first. And you're like, no one knows who they're going to interview first. You interview anybody. You find an interesting person. You do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And you know, you, you played your lottery ticket, right? You said, this is a ticket I want to play. And you know, this is, this is the amazing outcome of it. I'm honored to be on it. So thank you. Uh, I get to share my story. I get to have my own personal epiphanies. So you've translated the gift to me, which is great. And I think that's what a lot of people maybe mistake is that doing things in a positive way brings more positivity, not just to the person, but to other people. My micro gift for the day is realizing that I've been running a very interesting life of adventure in on multiple scales. Thank you, Yatsik. It has been such a pleasure to have you on here. And honestly, yeah. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. The only reason why you and I are able to have this conversation is because you said yes. And because someone extended the invitation to you and on my end, because you knew someone who knew someone. And so it's these little things, just reach out, just communicate, say yes, say no to the things you don't want. Be willing, right. put yourself out there. They're very simple, but it makes a huge difference. And over time, we're able to positively impact each other and share those gifts as you were mentioning. So yes, it's my pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you. Yeah. As we close out here, what is some advice you would give to your younger self? Oh, um, keep going. There are plenty of times where I doubted myself completely and I stopped. Uh, I don't know if you know the air fresheners that you see in like bathrooms and whatnot that like are on a timer. I invented that in like the 1990s. I was like, we have cats. Cats are stinky. I should put a timer with an air freshener. So it does this. 
And I proposed this to somebody and somebody said, that's silly. Manufacturing, that would be so... And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to throw this away. Every time I, I see one of those air fresheners, I remind myself that, no, no. Like sometimes the only person that will believe in you is you. Uh, be able to take advice, but also realize that if it's your dream, you have full responsibility of seeing it through. Uh, you're going to get it right more times than you're not. Follow your heart, make things better better as you go and uh, just keep going. It's a great life out there. You're carrying on the legacy of your father and your mother as well and their courage and their journey. What legacy do you hope your children carry on from you? Oh, uh, that's too much pressure to put on a kid or somebody else. So the only thing I want them to do is follow their heart, uh, know how to be good people and uh, make something better. That's it. There's no other, no, no other legacy or pressure that I would ever put on them. Like, I'm proud of them already as nine and seven year olds. They're phenomenal kids. Just keep doing what they're doing. And I'm going to be happy for the rest of my life. When someone hears make something better, at least for me, it's like, okay, I have to change the world. I have to solve world hunger. Wow. Mm. This feels big. How small can make something better be? It can be something as simple as just giving somebody a compliment. I remember... I was in Poland. I had a rough day at school and I was walking back home and some babushka comes up and she's walking and then she veers out of her way to come up to me. And she's like, Hey, this is all in Polish. Like you are too young to be this unhappy. Everything's going to be okay. And she gave me a hug and then she went on her way. I still remember that. That happened when I was like 14, you know, I'm 40 now. And I'm like, huh, that made me feel great. And it continues to make me feel great. So if I can walk down the street and just tell somebody hello, or, hey, that joke you said the other day, that was a really great joke. Or like, hey, I might not have all the answers right now, but I'm willing to help. How can I help? I'm just one person. I can't solve world hunger. But what I can do is say, thank you for cooking this dinner. Thank you for giving me a ride. Thank you for remembering to call me on my birthday. It's little things. And it's not just about receiving. It's about pushing out. If you can push out positivities. Like things get better real quick, but if you just absorb the negativities and don't push anything positive out, like, yeah, there's, there's nothing good as a glass half empty or is it half full. It depends on which way it's being filled or emptied. Don't aim to solve world hunger because nobody's going to as a one person band, but tell somebody something nice once in a while. And that, that might be the nicest thing they've heard all day, if not their life. Wow. That's beautiful. And it's so true. It is super, super true. Just the impact that being kind and seeing someone, hearing someone, taking a moment mm -hmm. to be present with them can make a really big difference. What is the last thing you'd like to leave with listeners? Thank you to you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, this was a wonderful time and thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your incredible stories and wisdom around creating opportunity. Some of the most simple things in life really are where the wisdom lies and where the keys to achieving our dreams and being successful is. And I really appreciate you joining me. Yatsik, is there a way that people can connect with you? Storiesbyyatsik.com. If there is one way that people could help you, what would it be? Oh, I would much rather appreciate people taking care of themselves, giving themselves the grace that I think a lot of us are forgetting to give. And then giving grace to other people, just give them room and see them and thank them and, and make them feel, like you said, make them feel heard and present. When we take care of ourselves, it eases pressure from other mm -hmm. people and everyone is a spider web, right? So you're just mm -hmm. one strand in that spider web. You don't know who all the other strands are. And so by easing that tension and being a little bit kinder to yourself and those around you, if those people then take care of themselves, that continues to ripple out. Similarly, is there any way that you can support other people? What should they reach out to you for? I would be more than happy to help anybody in whatever practical way that I can. I'd be more than happy to work on projects or efforts or mentorships, or even just having a good conversation over coffee. I'm here to be useful. We all have limited time on this planet and the more useful I can be, the better. To everyone out there, thank you for listening to the Opportunity Made podcast. 
it really is a pleasure to meet and spend time with good friends and share new ways that we can all create opportunity in the world. That's really what this is all about. So if this podcast has inspired you, please let me know at Opportunity Made on social media. And let's continue this conversation. Who knows what kind of opportunities are going to come from this? You can check out the show notes at www.opportunitymade.com. Serve widely, give greatly, and take care, y'all.